Iconic. Forgotten. Timeless. Innovative. These are the soundtracks that help shape and define what we hear in the video games that we play. I am Nitro, and this is the M-Disc Playlist's Video Game Music Primer, 1990. Dragon Quest IV, composed by Koichi Sugiyama. Dragon Quest IV tells the story of a hero and his companions who we learn about in separate chapters in a quest to save the world from Sorrow the Manslayer, who aspires to become the next ruler of evil. It would be hard to talk about video game primers without talking about the Dragon Quest series. Koichi Sugiyama is the one video game composer to be designated as the oldest gaming composer by the Guinness World Records. He has composed for every Dragon Quest game, including the spin-offs. What especially makes the Dragon Quest IV soundtrack stand out are the little details that were very rare for a Nintendo soundtrack. The most notable detail is the crescendo in the battle theme. A crescendo is an indicator to a music performer to make the music gradually louder or gradually softer. Such techniques were almost impossible to achieve on a Nintendo system. And in a time where ports to more advanced systems would improve the quality of the audio, the crescendo detail is lost in the PlayStation and Nintendo DS ports of Dragon Quest IV. The second most notable detail is the inclusion of leitmotifs. Leitmotifs are a recurring theme throughout a musical or literacy composition associated with a particular person, idea, or situation. The soundtrack to Dragon Quest IV accomplishes this with its amazing cast ensemble. You notice this in each chapter of the game when you're in the game's overworld. And in Chapter 5, when you've recruited all of your allies, the overworld music is determined by which party you put in your lineup first. Character themes in video games were even rarer than composition techniques like the crescendo or the leitmotifs. Because if leitmotifs were to be used in a Nintendo game, it would not necessarily fit a character, but an idea or a situation. Innovative details like these on top of a soundtrack that is both catchy, dramatic, and suspenseful mark for a soundtrack worthy of investment. Metal Gear 2, Solid Snake, composed by the Konami Kukehai Club. Metal Gear 2 was the second main entry in the Metal Gear series, about Solid Snake's mission to stop a terrorist plot in the military nation known as Zanzibar Land. It was a sequel that almost didn't happen, as Hideo Kojima, series creator, didn't plan on making any more Metal Gear games after the first one. It wasn't until after finding out about the game Snake's Revenge from one of that game's developers that he started to formulate his version of a sequel to the first game, which ended up being released a few months after the initial release of Snake's Revenge. At first glance, it doesn't look like it could be a Metal Gear game that could hold a candle to any of the games in the Solid series. However, a lot of the game mechanics many gamers noticed when playing Metal Gear Solid were actually introduced in Metal Gear 2. Smarter enemy AI, multiple ways to avoid the enemy, complex narratives, betrayal, and fourth wall breaking. But the game never received as much attention as the first few Metal Gear Solid games did until it was included as part of the Metal Gear Solid 3 Subsistence Collection. 
The style of music is parallel to the action drama style of music that was established in the first Metal Gear soundtrack and some of the Metal Gear Solid soundtrack. Normally, MSX2 games had a sound similar to what you would hear in most, if not all, Nintendo games. But, Metal Gear 2 manages to go beyond the typical chiptune sound to create a soundtrack that sounded sophisticated for an MSX2 game, a custom sound chip called the Konami SCC was developed in conjunction with synthesizer brand Yamaha. It had only been used in two previous games, Nemesis 2 and Snatcher. By inserting the Konami SCC inside the game cartridge, Konami was able to work with extra sound channels that otherwise weren't available in other games. Some of the music in the soundtrack would be reprised in the VR training disc of the Japanese release Metal Gear Solid Integral, released in the States as Metal Gear Solid VR Missions. Mega Man 3 Composed by Harumi Fujita and Yazuaki Fujita. After Manami Matsume composed Mega Man 1 and Takashi Tatisha composed Mega Man 2, the task of composing for a Mega Man game was left to Harumi Fujima. She was only able to finish three pieces before taking a maternity leave. Those three pieces were Needleman's stage theme, Gemini Man's stage theme, and the staff role. The rest of the soundtrack was composed by Yazuaki Fujita. Although the two share last names, there is no relation between the two. It was Yazuaki's first Capcom game as a primary composer. He had previously worked on the soundtrack to Final Fight along with various other Capcom composers. The Mega Man series tends to recycle themes and motifs from previous games. However, none of the music in Mega Man 3 was recycled. All of it was 100% original material. The Get Weapon theme from 3 did resurface in future Mega Man games, most notably appearing as an arrangement in the North American main theme of Mega Man X5. Mega Man games for the Nintendo are not only famous for redefining the action platformer genre, but for allowing players to follow a non-linear path to the end game. The Mega Man games are also highly regarded for their upbeat and catchy soundtracks. 3, in particular, is very consistent in presenting memorable pieces from the title screen sequence all the way to the staff roll. Misty Blue, composed by Yuzo Koshiro. Misty Blue is a first-person visual mystery novel. You are musician Kazuya Mizukami, who becomes the prime suspect of a murder after returning to Japan from studying abroad. Yuzo Koshiro was chosen to compose for this game. Before this, he was a primary composer for game company Nihon Falcom. After becoming a freelance composer, he shifted his composition skills to the 16-bit consoles. But he still found time to work on a few PC Engine games, like Misty Blue. The music in Misty Blue does an excellent job showcasing why Yuzo Koshiro was considered one of the best composers in the 90s. His influences were primarily what was popular on MTV at the time, and the music of Prince. Specifically, Prince's contribution to the Tim Burton Batman movie. With those influences, he was able to craft an upbeat soundtrack blending Eurodance, rock, and 80s pop into one game. 
It's very apropos that this soundtrack sound like the music that was popular back in the day, as the game does involve interacting with many different people in the entertainment industry. Super Mario World Composed by Koji Kondo Super Mario World was one of the key launch titles for the Super Nintendo, and arguably the best of Mario's 2D adventures. In this game, Mario has to rescue Princess Peach from Bowser on Dinosaur Land. Here in Dinosaur Land, he is assisted by his newest friend and Nintendo's newest character, Yoshi. Yes, Mario punches Yoshi. We've known this for a long time. Koji Kondo, primary Nintendo composer at the time, composed the entire soundtrack using an electronic keyboard. If there is ever an example of how to perfect the variation technique in music composition, it's this game. Most of the themes you hear in this game are variations of one another. The outdoor and indoor athletic themes, the ghost house, the castle, and the underwater themes. They are all variations of one single overarching theme. But the variations are done so in a way that they can still be considered catchy, enjoyable, and fitting to the level. Be it a haunting atmosphere, or an underwater waltz, or just your typical athletic theme, you'll feel like you're hearing something fresh every time. And speaking of Yoshi, anytime you took a ride on Yoshi, bongo drums would be added to the music in real time. It's little innovations like this, and the way variation was used, that helped make Super Mario World a musical standout in the wake of a brand new system. Of course, the pieces that weren't variations of the overall theme deserve praise as well, particularly the final battle theme against Bowser. Koji Kondo was inspired by hard rock music of the 70s, but hardware limitations prevented him from really showcasing that influence. However, the Super Nintendo gave him a chance to show us the kind of rock music that he was capable of in one of the most dramatic and one of the most intense battles against the king of all Koopas. Finally, what made this soundtrack stand out was Kondo's ability to sneak in an easter egg within the soundtrack. If you wait a while in the special world map, you'll hear an arrangement of the very theme that made Koji Kondo famous in the 80s. The athletic theme from the very first Super Mario Brothers. Super Mario World was a one-of-a-kind soundtrack for its time, a technical innovation, and a worthwhile introduction to the Super Nintendo. F-Zero Composed by Yumiko Kanki and Naoto Ishida. F-Zero was fast-paced. F-Zero was exciting. F-Zero was rocking. And F-Zero was incredibly fast. In addition to using F-Zero as an opportunity to showcase its fast-paced gaming and its Mode 7 graphics, F-Zero gave Nintendo the opportunity to showcase a fast-paced rock and jazz soundtrack performed on the Super Nintendo hardware. Like Mario, Zelda, and Metroid before, F-Zero's inaugural game in the franchise was filled to the brim with iconic pieces. For example, the Mute City theme could arguably be considered F-Zero's main theme. Since Captain Falcon's inclusion in the Super Smash Bros. series, the Mute City theme has become more closely associated with the Captain Falcon character. This makes the Mute City theme more iconic, as at one point in F-Zero's development, Captain Falcon came close to becoming the mascot for the Super Nintendo. 
But the F-Zero soundtrack was more than just Mute City. For each track you raced on, it was a mood setter. Some of these racetracks were very intense. However, even the most intense tracks didn't require intense music. And as fast as this game was, the music wasn't required to match that fast-paced intensity. The music blended several different elements of rock and fusion jazz into something that could be considered more pleasant than intense. The other thing that is worthy of mentioning here is the bass throughout. It's hard to hear over the sound effects in the game, but pay attention when you pause the game in specific tracks. You will definitely notice some of the best bass work to help show off the capabilities of the Nintendo SSMP audio processor. And it's not just one bass either. You get different kinds of bass samples throughout. Different bass samples to create a kind of rock soundtrack that would not have been possible on other soundtracks at the time. Star Tropics Composed by Yoshio Hirai Star Tropics was a special kind of game, in the sense that it was developed by a Japanese staff, featuring director Genyo Takeda, who also directed the Nintendo version of Punch-Out! And yet, it was never released in Japan. Star Tropics is about a young boy named Mike, who traverses through different islands and monster-infested dungeons in search for his missing uncle. The game played like traditional JRPGs in the overworld, but inside the dungeons, it played more like a graphically enhanced Zelda title. Yoshio Horai's composition profile for video games is small, as only two of the three titles he worked on were Star Tropics games. But it's hard to dispute how fun this soundtrack is. The soundtrack can go from very lively to very dramatic in mere moments. What makes the lively music stand out is the bass work. If you listen carefully to the overworld theme, the dungeon theme, the overworld theme while in the submarine, the Miracola theme, and the final dungeon themes back to back, you will hear the same bass riff used each time. It's almost as if the more upbeat pieces were built around this specific bass riff. Rarely do you hear this much effort placed in a large portion of a video game soundtrack, even by today's standards. Star Tropics also managed to incorporate music into one of the game's puzzles. During Chapter 5 of the game, you have to play an organ hitting the notes in a specific pattern. The pattern is told to you by a parrot using solfeggio, the method of education used to teach children about singing in specific pitches. You would recognize solfeggio by its syllables Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. The game required that you learn which notes of the organ matched the Solveggio symbols by ear. Star Tropics is well known for the puzzle that required you to dip a letter that came with a physical copy of the game in water to find a secret code. As great and as creative as that was, it shouldn't overshadow the important role that music played in Star Tropics, both in game and behind the scenes. ActRaiser, composed by Yuzo Koshiro. In ActRaiser, you play the role of God, and your main objective is to resurrect the world lost to Satan and his powerful lieutenants. The game is played in two different ways. One is the action style, where you control an animated statue as it destroys the enemies in front of it. 
The second is the simulation style, where you control God's faithful agent servant as he rebuilds civilization from the parts of the world cleared by monsters. This was Yuzo Koshiro's first assignment for the Super Nintendo, and his first job working with a system that didn't have an FM synthesizer. Although with the Super Nintendo hardware, he found that it was easier to recreate the string sound than on the previous systems he had worked with. In the 16-bit era, he has stated that he preferred working on the Sega Genesis, but he still found it relatively easy to compose the music for ActRaiser by swapping samples from the ROM data, allowing him to only load the parts of the music samples he needed without having to limit himself to the Super Nintendo's 64 kilobit memory limit and its inability to load multiple samples at a time. Video game music before ActRaiser's initial release did not sound anything like this. This was the closest any game had come to creating that authentic orchestra sound at the time. Only released in the Super Nintendo's second month in Japan, Yuzo Koshiro showcased the potential that the Nintendo SSMP audio processor was capable of delivering. The Secret of Monkey Island Composed by Michael Land and Patrick Mundy All Guybrush Threepwood wanted to be was a pirate. Little did he know that he would have to find buried treasure, successfully steal from the governor's mansion, and excel in insult sword fighting to become a pirate. Not the Pirates of the Caribbean kind of pirate, but a very awkward yet kind-hearted pirate. The formula for a classic LucasArts adventure game is this. Witty writing, memorable characters, and a cinematic score that seemed commonplace in LucasArts games, but uncommon in other games, especially console games at the time. The Secret of Monkey Island was the first LucasArts game to use an in-house composer, Michael Land. Despite that honor, Land found composing for the game difficult. He had the freedom to compose the game how he envisioned it, by incorporating lighthearted Caribbean and reggae music everywhere, even during the most tense situations. But the sound engine he had to work with made it difficult for Land to bring his musical vision to life. So with the help of his friend Patrick Mundy, the two created a sound engine that he described as making music respond to the unpredictable interactive changes in the game as if the music had been composed with advanced knowledge about what was going to happen. This engine would be called iMuse. The iMuse sound engine enabled the game to decide which of the music layers would be emphasized over the others in any situation the game presented to the player. Thus, making adding an interactivity element to the game's soundtrack. The iMuse system wouldn't actually be used until the game's sequel, LeChuck's Revenge. But the challenges that Land faced when composing for the first Monkey Island help influence an audio system capable of recognizing which scenarios warranted the most appropriate music tones. As for this very game, one of the most popular pieces is the main theme. Land states that the music came to him almost immediately while playing on an organ except for the last few seconds of the theme, which took considerably more effort to write. The Secret of Monkey Island is a prime example of a game that helped not only define the adventure genre and writing in video games, but it also helped inspire how music can be used to actually enhance the gaming experience beyond simply adding music to the background and leaving it there. Welcome to 
Turrican, composed by Chris Hewelsbeck. Preceding the ominous greeting was a soundtrack that was very suitable for a run and gun style game, with inspiration literally drawn from the soundtrack of the original animated Transformers movie and Manowar. The metal influence is definitely felt throughout this game. Even in the loading screens, you are given a rockin' track to help ease the waiting period. In Turrican, you are a bioengineered warrior with the task of liberating the colony of Altera from the rebellious organisms from a corrupt ecosystem network known as Morgul, Multiple Organism Unit Link. This game was developed for the Commodore 64, but the C64 version hardly had a soundtrack. Certainly the kind of soundtrack Chris Hulsbeck contributed to the Amiga version of this game. With the kind of metal influence the soundtrack had, he could have easily given every part of the game a stellar, head-banging piece to accompany the game. But he didn't. In certain areas, the music is nothing but isolated winds, creepy clicking sounds, and the only resemblance of music of any kind is a very scattered drum riff. Not many games, especially in the run and gun genre, did this. In this genre, every level had to have music. Music with a real melody. Even the haunting, ominous worlds had to have music accompany them. Turrican and Chris Hulsbeck broke that traditional mold and added a kind of eerie element rarely seen in run and gun games even today. Turrican has become one of the more cult classic franchises from the 90s. Arguably, however, the most popular aspect of this game has always been the music. Quintessential for its time, but also a timeless part of video game history. And that concludes the 1990 edition of the M-Disc Playlist Video Game Music Primer. Follow and subscribe on Twitter, YouTube, Stitcher, and your favorite RSS feed all under M-Disc Playlist. Good night, and have a pleasant tomorrow.